There are a few coaches in any sport who show more joy than you do. How do you describe the joy of the moment? Well, that's, that's been my word all year, and, and I, I just tried to have been. In, I tried to be intentional with that. And um, for me personally, joy comes from focusing on Jesus, others, and yourself. And um, man, I mean, you know, very few people. There's so many great coaches that that are so deserving of a moment like this that never get the chance to experience it. And um, to get to do it once and now to get to do it again, you know, I'm just, it's just, a, it's a blessing. And, I, and I, it's just simply the grace of the good Lord to allow us to experience something like this. And I'm so happy for our team, our fans, our administration, our former players that love the ball. And, uh, and you know, there ain't never been a 15-0 team. And I know we're not supposed to be here. We're just little old Clemson. And I'm not supposed to be here, but we are, and I am. And I, how about them Tigers, man? I'm so proud of our guys, these seniors. We beat Notre Dame in Alabama. We left no doubt. And we walk off this field tonight as the first 15-0 team in college football history. And uh, all the credit, all the glory goes to the good Lord, number one. And number two, to these young people. When you get a young group of people that believe, are passionate, they love each other, they sacrifice, they're committed to... To, to a singleness of purpose, you better look out. Great things can happen, and that's what you saw tonight. After four games, you made a decision. You chose Trevor Lawrence to become your quarterback. What did you see then that came true tonight, Dabo? Well, I mean, he, he was the best player, you know, and um, and that's not a knock against Kelly Bryant. I love Kelly Bryant, and uh, what a great player he is. But, it, but my job is to, is to make decisions that put the team in the best possible uh, path to win. And uh, after four games, he was the best player. And so I think you saw that. And, and in fact, I think when I got here, Holly's first question to me when I got here was, you know, hey, what are you going to do to us? Never lost a game. And I said, well, I don't think Trevor has either. So uh, I'm just going to work on my guy here and see if we can walk off this field and keep our guy undefeated. And I'm just, you know, we bent a little, but we never broke. We punched back. You know, this guy, this group had to eye the tiger tonight, man. They, and, and listen, Alabama, <laughs> this, this is the most amazing champion ever, the University of Alabama, and what they've done, and Coach Saban. And for our guys to come out here tonight and perform like they did, you know, it's just our staff, we had an amazing plan, we had a great week. And uh, I felt like we had the better team. Uh, and I felt like that if we could get a couple of breaks, we could, we could, we could pull away. And uh, the, the couple of turnovers and the big plays, I said coming in yesterday to you guys, big plays and turnovers. You win those two things, you win 98% of the time. And, and uh, we won it in a big way tonight. You've been saying for a long time that Alabama has been driving the bus yeah, in this right. sport. They've been in bus hey, one, bus two, hey, bus three. Don't even been, Listen, we drove the Roy bus all the way out here to wherever the heck California we are, all right, to play a football game in a beautiful stadium in a beautiful place. And uh, who's we're driving proud, now? Proud members of the Roy bus. So for all them other teams out there on that bus, hey, listen, I hope that you get a little, a little hope from us and a little inspiration that, hey, if we can do it, anybody can do it. And that's, that's, I mean that. Listen, if a guy like me, I said this two years ago. I, I, I mean, you can't write a Hollywood script like this. Only God can do this. And that's a fact. And, and people may think I'm crazy or quacky or whatever, but only God can orchestrate this. You can't, no Hollywood producer can write it. But I'm just telling you, if I can do it, if these Clemson Tigers can do it, hey, anybody can do it if you have a belief in yourself and what you're doing and you surround yourself with a bunch of great young people that are passionate about winning and tonight we conquered a mountain that ain't ever been conquered the flags on the top and uh man i just i can't wait to celebrate i can't wait congratulations Dabo. do it with your team yes, well man. done thank you thank you god bless everybody and i wanted to talk <clears throat> this weekend about for sure and let me just give you basically the definition when I say the word for sure, have you ever been sure about anything? Absolutely. I was sure when I answered God's call. I was sure when I asked Susan to marry me 
There's lots of things I've been really, really, really sure about. And as I have grown in my relationship with God, I've become very sure about things in his word. And this guy, this coach here, amazing, you know, he was sure about his relationship with Almighty God, unashamed to speak about it publicly before thousands, probably millions of people who may have watched and are watching it and all, but he was sure about his relationship with God. And he was sure about the cause of his success with his team. He was sure, absolutely. You know, so when we're talking about, when you hear me say this word for sure, I'm talking about confident. I'm talking about positive, talking about convinced, with no doubt, you know, persuaded, assured. And there's this assurance that comes in our relationship with Almighty God. There's assurance that comes when we pray about things and we, we pray God's way, what he's taught us in his word. He's always teaching us things like this coach was teaching his boys and they learned how to win some serious ball games, you know. If you're in the college league, it's pretty phenomenal. But you know, God is, is discipling us, disciplining us, and that's what a disciple means, a disciplined one. Those guys had disciplined so they could play and they could succeed. And so we see that confidence and and that conviction, we, we see that assurance in this man who spoke up for Christ first before he ever said anything about football, you know, and that's what powered him and drove him on. So I want you to see that since we're in the football uh, Super Bowl season here, and maybe it would uh, stir your hearts and your minds a little bit. Um, and are you sure of your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? And when you're sure of your relationship, not rules and regulations, but I'm going to tell you, things begin to happen. Things begin to happen for good and, and not evil and gives us hope and gives us a future. And I truly believe with all my heart, as we're launching out into the year 2019, we're already into February. Can you imagine that already? You know, I'm, I measure February by I've got you know, James' was birthday is today, Susan's is on Monday, my brother's is on Tuesday, and it's just like I can measure February by family birthdays and things like that. But we, a month is already gone. How many months does that leave us this year? Eleven. I believe the best is yet to come, you know. And you and I can both be sure. You can absolutely be confident about your future. You can if you want to be, you know, there's some more simple principles that we must apply. So we're absolutely persuaded and we're assured. We, we are convinced with no doubts about what the future has in store for us. It can be sure if you want it to be. Uh, because what's la uh, left if we're not sure about something, if we're not confident about it, well, then there's a lot of uh, anxiety. There's a lot of worry. There's a lot of Doubt, there's a lot of fear that comes. But let me read you a little article I came across, very interesting. Uh, a church camp counselor told of his experience with a nine-year-old boy who started crying the first night when they turned out the cabin lights. Are you afraid of the dark? One of the counselors asked. No, the boy replied. He just didn't want to be attacked by the killer rabbits. <laughs> Some older kids at home had told him that there were killer rabbits who would come out at night and attack the campers. Shame on those older boys, you know. Jesus, if you think about it, was constantly reassuring the disciples with these words throughout the Bible. Fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. You see it hundreds of times in the Bible. Fear not, fear not, fear not. Why? We're tempted to fear, are we not? All kinds of things, you know, tempt us to be afraid about our future, our family's future, our health, our finances, you know, our nation, about, you know, calamity or storms or wars. All kinds of things try to intimidate us. 
Their fears betrayed, and this is the disciples, their fears betrayed the lack of faith. When one traces these words and their usage throughout the Bible, it seems that one of man's constant needs is to be reassured. Children are that way. Teenagers are that way. Adults are that way. It's just like you look at you're doing good. You, you, you're doing okay. You, you're going to make it. You ever need reassurance about something? Absolutely, we do. Anyhow, the Bible, it seems that one of man's constant needs is to be reassured of the presence and the comfort of God who is almighty. Not half mighty, not three quarters mighty, but God who is almighty. We can draw on God's presence to find comfort and destroy our fears. You don't have to let fear control you. Watch out for killer rabbits. They can destroy your peace of mind at camp and throughout your life. So don't believe the lie. Devil whispers things in your mind to try to get you to believe a lie, does he not? You know, that's just as ridiculous as the killer rabbit thing. And the devil whispers little thoughts to try us to go negative, to be doubt-filled and fearful. That's what he's always trying to do. And God's word, if you'll pick it up and begin to read it, you'll see over and over and over and over again, he says, fear not. For sure, he don't want us being afraid. He wants us to be confident. He wants us to be positive, convinced with no doubt. He wants us to be persuaded and assured that everything that he says is absolutely true. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 24, it says, You can go to bed, you can go to bed without fear. For sure, you can. Now some people go, I can't, I can't. I close my eyes and sit in a dark room and all these fears just overwhelm me. You know, you can go to bed. How many of you believe that you can go to bed without fear? Absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt. You can be confident when you go to bed and be positive and convinced. And, and there's no doubts at all that God's going to take care of you while you sleep. You're persuaded. You're assured of everything that he says. For sure, you can have that assurance. You genuinely can if you want to. It's a choice that you and I will make. And it says here, you can go to bed without fear. You will lie down and sleep. What's that say? Oh, I must have had the same translation there. I'm sorry. You can go to bed without fear. You will lie down and sleep soundly. You can have pleasant dreams. You don't have to think on negative stuff. You really don't. Verse 25 says, you need not be afraid of sudden disaster or the destruction that comes upon the wicked. You don't have to be afraid of that. There's some disasters going to happen in our world or just in my life or in my family or my health or my finances and, and that fear. And you know what Job said? He says, the things I feared most came upon me. Because you know what fear is? Fear is faith. It's believing something bad's going to happen. And Job said, the thing I feared most came upon me. And, and we see it all throughout the New Testament. All things are possible to those who believe. You believe something good's going to happen? Here it comes. You really, really believe something bad's going to happen? You help create it. So we need to become sure about the promises of Almighty God. And we need to learn to cast down the negative thoughts. We see a coach who was so positive because he had fallen in love with Jesus and he lived by the words of Almighty God and it impacted his whole team. And he was, you know, God was the very first thing he said about, you know, he spoke about when he had opportunity to testify on public television around the world. You know, pretty amazing when you think of it. Anyhow, verse 25 says, you need not be afraid of sudden disaster or the destruction that comes upon the wicked. Hmm. Our confidence does not have to go up and down like the stock market does. It does not. It, it doesn't rise and fall on the stock market. 
If, if your confidence rises and falls upon the uh, depreciation or the appreciation of, of stocks or funds or whatever, your confidence is in the wrong place. Our confidence needs to be in God Almighty who is in control of everything. And we can be sure that the best is yet to come. We genuinely can. Verse 26 says, for the Lord is your security, your, your safety, your, your refuge, your sanctuary. The Lord is your security, you know. And you can be confident about the things that you're doing in your own life. You can be confident and, and positive. You can be absolutely convinced with no doubt. You can be. If we'll spend a little time in his word and it will build our faith in an amazing ways and you can be absolutely persuaded persuaded you know for sure this is the truth and I can count on almighty God take care of us assured we're talking about Jesus says in John chapter 14 verse 27 he says I'm leaving you with a gift have you ever received a gift you ever given a gift? He says, I am leaving you with a gift. It means you can't buy it. You can't steal it. You can't earn it. He says, I'm leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. The world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. This is a peace, he says. This is an internal peace. It's a peace that does not come from a substance. A temporary worldly peace that comes from a substance that it wears off and your peace is gone. He says, I'm leaving you with a gift. The peace of mind and the peace of heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world can't give. So don't be troubled and don't be afraid. You, you can hardly be aware of peace unless you have some unpeaceful situations. You know what I'm talking about? You know, oh, everybody has peace when everything is peaceful. What about when some things just go awry? It's not peaceful circumstances. You've probably seen this picture of a little bird who's built his nest right under the edge of a waterfall. And thousands of tons of water are going over and the spray is... A little bit of the spray is hitting the bird, and he's on a little vine that's there with his nest. He's definitely not in a peaceful situation with this thunderous waterfall going over him, but he's peaceful. He is. Now, you and I, can we be at peace when things are chaotic around about us? We can have this peace that passes all understanding. People who are living in a... Uh, Tropical region, when you think about it, don't have to deal with uh, winter, you know, snow and ice and all those kinds of things. But you know what they also don't have to deal with? People who live in a tropical environment don't have the joy of springtime. Is springtime pretty cool? Man, when everything is thawed out and the crocuses start perking up, you know, and sticking their little heads through the, the uh, sod there and Blossoms, and then there's blossoms and flowers everywhere, and the bees are beginning to make their honey, and the birds are getting their nests ready, and they're singing and chirping and carrying on. Springtime is fantastic. This is testimony of resurrection as things are coming back alive. But we wouldn't have spring if we didn't have winter. Is that right? So some negative-looking things can actually enhance our life. We appreciate uh, springtime a whole lot more more so than those who live in a tropical environment where it stays the same all the time. John chapter 16, verse 33 in the Message Bible, it says, I've told you all this so that trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured deeply at peace. He says, I've told you all this so you can trust me that trusting me, you can be unshakable. When things happen in this world, sometimes they shake us up. But Jesus says, I've told you all this, that trusting me, you will be 
unshakable and assured, for sure, confident, positive I'm talking about, you know. He said you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. No doubt, absolutely persuaded and assured, deeply at peace. In this, godly, in this godless world, you will continue to experience, hmm, that's a promise. You, you like the fact that you're going to experience some difficulties? You think those guys who trained for football had any difficulties? And their coach did it on purpose to make them carry heavy weights and run unbelievable laps and do all kinds of things that hurt their muscles. But what did it do for them? Made them stronger. And it caused them to win ball games. And he says, in this God, this world, you will continue to experience difficulties, but take heart. I've conquered the world, Jesus said, for sure. And he's saying for you and I to trust him. He's conquered the world, and you and I can be confident. We can be positive. We can be absolutely convinced about what he has said. Persuaded beyond a shadow of a doubt. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9 says, and, and God the Father says this. He says, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Where'd you go today? The Lord is with you. Whether you knew it or not. You go, he walked. Oh, no. He's with you wherever you go. For sure. He has never abandoned you. We may turn our backs on him, but he'll never turn his back on us. Joshua 1.9 says, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We have courage, not because we're strong, but because we have a relationship with Almighty God, who is strong. That's where our strength comes from. He's powerful, and he rules over everything. And God has never changed. He doesn't change but he changes us. And, and God's love for you will see you through the year 2019. And there's all kinds of things in front of us, and we'll have some difficulties, but we'll overcome them just like in football players overcome the guys trying to block them, the dry, guys trying to intercept. And they overcame, and they won a game. And you and I can be absolutely as convinced that God is for us. He's going to help us through every situation. You know, we're secure in a very unsafe world. And this world is unsafe. Did you know that? This world is unsafe. And it's always been unsafe. But we, we here in America are recognizing it more and more and more. Other parts of the world have known it maybe quicker than we have how unsafe it is. But we live in an unsafe world. An unsafe world. But God, he loves us. And he's with us. So we can be absolutely, positively secure and sure that everything's going to be okay because God is in control when we've yielded to him. A familiar passage in Romans 8, 35, it says, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble? I talked about this a couple weeks ago. Does it mean he no longer loves us if, if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? And I love the way verse 37 answers that question. And this is really a worthwhile passage to memorize. It says, no, it don't mean you don't love us no more. That's not what it means. It says, no, despite all these things, the trouble, the calamity, the difficulties, persecution and all that, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. I don't know if you read the whole Bible or not, but ultimately... God wins. His team wins. So if you're not decided on what team you're going to be pull, pulling for, God's team ultimately wins it all. He really does. And this world is really not our home. We are, as the Bible says, pilgrims 
and we're passing through. We're passing through, and we're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And, uh, you know, I wasn't sure I was going to tell you all this or not, but uh, I've asked you all a week ago to be praying for my neighbor, who I've been reaching out to for about eight months now. And I've, I see my neighbor before y'all get up in the morning, usually, and I see him after y'all go to bed at night, you know, and often I'll see him at time during the day. He's been in the hospital now, and I had the privilege of leading him to Christ about two weeks ago. He's 87 years old, a German guy, and uh, he, he has really genuinely uh, accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and all. And uh, yesterday, this is Saturday, it was Thursday morning. I was there for around 7 o'clock, and somebody, you know how nurses come in, and they wake you up to give you a sleeping pill and stuff like that, you know. Um, but someone have waken him up, and uh, he's getting pretty weak up there, you know. Uh, he's actually in hospice at the moment. But um, he told me, he said, oh, somebody woke me up. And he said, I was having this wonderful, wonderful dream about heaven. He's like, fantastic. He didn't want to be woke up. He didn't. Well, about that time, the hospital was becoming busy. People were coming in, do this and do that and do this and all. And uh, all I wanted to do was just say, tell me what it was like. So last night, I was up there in the hospital, and there was only one other person in the room. And I said, this dream you had, tell me what heaven was like. And then he said something my mind just couldn't grasp hold of. And I still don't really grasp hold of it. But he has this little cute twinkle in his eye when he smiles. He said, heaven is like you. And then he said, you'll see. And that's all he would tell me about it. You know? And I wonder. It's just like. I mean, it's so humbling because I don't feel like I represent heaven that well, I'll be honest with you. But when somebody's having a dream and they're just hours away from seeing Jesus face to face, he said, heaven's like you with a twinkle in his eye. You'll see. Think about that. Are people getting little glimpses of heaven from your life and my life? You know, that's what it's all about, is it not? We are pilgrims, as the Bible says. We're, we're passing through looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity. An opportunity. Have you ever been given an opportunity? An opportunity is really something good, isn't it? An opportunity, a new job, an opportunity to do this, or opportunity to do something, you know, that's uh, wonderful and fantastic and great, you know? Think about it, you know. But he says here, brothers and sisters, when trouble comes your way, consider it an opportunity to grit your teeth and complain. Is that what it says? You ever do that? I said, do you ever do that? I think we're tempted to do that when things don't go the way we think that they should go. But he says, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for joy. I'm not sure what translation we have up there. I forgot to write them out and they did it perfect. I failed to get it to them right tonight. But I'm reading out of the translation. I'm, I put my notes in, and it says, you know, an opportunity, consider it an opportunity for great joy. You mean when difficulties come my way, God has given me an opportunity to operate in the supernatural. Is it natural to rejoice when trouble comes your way? No. no. If you rejoice... When trouble comes your way, you're operating in the supernatural. And when you begin to operate in the supernatural, other supernatural things can begin to take place in your life. 
because you're beginning to learn you don't have to be governed by circumstances. You can begin to believe what the promises of Almighty God says if you want to. But he says, consider it an opportunity for joy, for great joy, for you know, and this is for sure, you know for sure, and I'm talking about you're, you're confident, you're, you're positive, you're convinced, no doubts here, you're persuaded, you're assured, for you know that when your faith is tested, does your faith fall apart? No. He said, you know, when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. And then God gives us wisdom. He says, let it grow. When you plant a flower or a vegetable, you let it grow. You could dig it up, couldn't you? He says, but when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. The endurance, you can endure anything, and you can win, and you can be successful like a football uh, game. He says, so let it grow for when your endurance is fully developed, and that's what's happening in you and me. Are we allowing our endurance to fully develop, or do we complain at every little old thing, or do we hang on a little while longer, and we praise God, and we rejoice when difficulties come, and we begin to operate in the supernatural, or, because he says here in verse 4, so let it grow for when your endurance is fully developed you will be I'm sorry I didn't get you the right translation but my translation says you will be perfect and complete needing nothing perfect and complete needing nothing there are those who live in great prosperity and they have lots of money and lots of possessions, yet their lives are consumed with worry and fear. Does possessions remove fear from our life? Probably brings more because we got to protect our stuff. Hmm. There are those in our world today who live in very difficult and dangerous places Yet they have a great sense of security because they have placed their faith and their hope in God. See, our security is not placed in stuff. Our security is when we, we, we put our faith in the almighty God. Wherever we're at, whatever we're doing, we're okay because we've got a relationship with almighty God. Psalms 125 verse 1 says, Those who trust in the Lord are as secure as Mount Zion. They will not be defeated, but will endure forever. And that's for sure. Positively will endure forever those who trust in the Lord. You're like a mountain. You know, a, a little wind or a little storm, even a tornado or a hurricane does not move mountains. He says, those who trust in the Lord are as secure as Mount Zion, and they'll not be defeated, but they will endure forever. Verse 2 says, just as the mountains around Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. Hmm. Just as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forever. Let me read that to you again in the Message Bible. It says, those who trust in God are like Zion Mountain. Nothing can move it. A rock-solid mountain you can always depend on. And this is the way God is, for sure. And you can be confident that God is greater than any old mountain. And he says he's around us. Verse 2 says, mountain, mountains encircle Jerusalem and God encircles his people, always has and always will. Pete had become lost in the desert and had been chasing mirages. He ended up in a deserted town with a well in the very center. His mouth was parched from the intense heat. He ran to the well with his last ounce of energy. He vigorously pumped the handle, only to find no water would come out. 
Then he looked up and he saw a note nailed to a post and it said, look behind the rock where a five gallon container of water will be found. And it warned against drinking or using any of the water for anything besides priming the pump. Every ounce is needed and not even one drop could be spared, the note emphasized. After pouring the water down the pump. Now, if you were dying of thirst and you found five gallons of water and it said, don't drink it, but pour it in the pump and you'll get plenty of water, what would you do? A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, maybe. Five gallons of water might quench my thirst today, but may not give me enough water to get out of the desert. When it says, after pouring the water down the pump, the note said, pump, handle vigorously, and all the water you desire will come forth. And the note said, one last instruction was to please fill the water can and place it behind the rock for the next weary soul who might happen to come along. How hard it is for people to give up that sure thing Five gallons of water, you know, to give up the sure thing for something they can't quite see. It takes faith. Well, we pour it in a pump and it, it, it wets the, uh, the little uh, leather uh, washer things in there and they stick to the side. And, and, and some people, they're going to believe in what they see more so than believe in what they read. And he says here, he says how hard it is for people to give up a sure thing for something they cannot see at the time. Well, that's what we call faith. It's faith. Let me give you a verse, and I'll prove it to you right here. Beyond the shadow of a doubt, I'm going to put you in the desert for just a moment, okay? In the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, chapter 3, and this is more true and more reliable than what was written on that post in that desert. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 in the Message Bible. It says, bring your full tithe. That's a small portion of what God has given to us. It's a, a portion that God says belongs to him. This is what he says. Bring your full tithe to the temple treasury so there'll be ample provisions in my temple this is God talking. He says, test me in this and see if I don't open up heaven itself to you and pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. Let, let me just ask, okay? Just for the benefit of those who know, how many of you have chosen to do it God's way and you found it worked? It was true. And sometimes we choose to drink the water ourselves. And we don't have near as much as God intended us to have. Now, I'm just telling you the honest goodness truth. That's why I've always challenged for 39 years of being a pastor here, anybody, whoever put God to the test, to bring their tithe, it's not a gift, it's what we owe God, to bring our tithe to God. And I've told everybody who's ever asked, if God don't do it, you give him a month or two and see if God does what he promises to do. And if he doesn't, you come and see us. We'll talk to the bookkeeper and he'll give it all back to you. So how can you promise that? Because God says, it's the only place in the Bible, he says, test me in this and see if I don't open up heaven itself to you and pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. As saying like, take the five gallons of water and pour it into the pump to prime the pump. And then pump it vigorously. And God says, and you see, if I don't give you all the water you can drink, you can fill up the trough and take a bath in it, fill up anything you've got. You can pump hundreds and thousands of gallons out and fill up the five-gallon uh, you know, can and put it back to help the next person along the way. It's a principle. It's a truth for sure. Absolutely positive. You can be confident. You can be convinced about this with absolutely no doubt 
persuaded and absolutely assured that everything God has said is absolutely true. But our tendency is not to believe him, it's to believe our natural eye and to believe our natural appetites and our our natural desires. That is our tendency. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said to the whole body of Christ. He was speaking to the disciples and the early disciples, and he was talking about God's stimulus package, if you would. In Philippians 4.19, and it says, And this same God who takes care of me, that's Apostle Paul, and this same God who takes care of me will supply half of your needs. What's it say? I think all the translation says it that way. And this same God who makes, who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches and abundant resources which have been given, have been given, that's past tense, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. When we're in a relationship with Christ Jesus, he says all of our needs are going to be met when we're in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're learning to follow him and to obey him. And that is for sure. Paul was saying, this is a sure deal. You can bank on it. You can be positive and confident about this, you know. Uh, We're talking about persuaded. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says, and this is Jesus talking. He says, my grace, and that's talking about unmerited favor, but it's talking about God's enabling power. My grace is all you need. My power works Best in weakness. Hmm. Is anybody here weak? Three? Okay, that's cool. That's awesome. It's my credentials. Now, I know I've shared this concept before. Do we have uh, some hot water back there at the coffee thing? Could y'all bring me a, like a cup of hot water? Now, don't drink it all, Joe. Thank you, brother. All right, perfect. Now, is that a very strong drink? It's hot, but it don't have much uh, nourishment in it, does it? Now, what's this right here? Tea bag. I don't know if you notice it or not, but there's a wee bit of color starting to show up. Just a wee bit. Now, you imagine for a moment that the tea bag is Jesus, okay? And you imagine for a moment that the hot water is you, okay? Let me see here. What was I reading that? <clears throat> he says in 2 Corinthians twelve nine. he says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Hmm. Tea bags work best in weak water, don't it? I think I have a coffee here. It's been left here for several weeks. It's pretty nasty looking, as a matter of fact coffee grounds and something kind of fuzzy floating on the top of it. 
Now let me ask you a question. What do I have in that cup? Well, I thought there was water in there. You mean when the strength of the tea infuses into the water, it changes the water and now you call it tea. And when Christ is allowed to come into us, weak as we are, and then we call ourselves Christian, which just means Christ-like. Now, I think I have another tea bag. And then I'm going to ask a volunteer to try them both. Okay. Now, I can guarantee you one thing, that what's in this cup here is strong before the tea bag ever showed up. Can you, can you, I'm not even sure if I can get it to sink, I don't know. So now what do you call that? A mess. You're right. Because the tea bag works better in the weak drink, does it not? In the water. Let me see if I can read that to you again. Jesus says, my grace, my enabling power is all you need. And my power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness, says, the apostle says, so that the power of Christ can work through me. The truth of it is, we like to put the best apples on the top of the barrel, don't we? If you want to take them to the market. We don't like people to see our weaknesses, do we? But which really made a fine drink in a fine cup of tea? Which one? Which one do you want to drink out of? Oh, that's pretty good. I need a volunteer. <laughs> mm. it smells like coffee. With fuzzy stuff on it. Yeah. Oh, it's chewable. <laughs> Let's wash it down. <clears throat> Please bless what I just drank, Lord. Okay. Well, anyhow, you can be absolutely sure in your weaknesses. Go, well, I, I'm too weak, I can't do that. That's, that's been my credential. Susan knows this. Since I was in Bible school, since I answered God's call, and there's not a week hardly that goes by that I don't make mention somehow or another that God has chosen the weak things of the world, and that's my credentials. I'm weak enough that God, Christ, can show up in me. Are we weak enough? Are we, are we self-sufficient? Are, are we strong-willed people? Or are we weak and do we humble ourselves and yield ourselves? And God says, His strength is perfected in our weakness. God can use any man, woman, boy, and girl who hears my voice right now. God can use you to make an eternal difference in this world. Because Christ can be seen then in your life. If you're weak enough. But if we're so strong and independent, it's hard for anybody to see him in our lives. Does that make sense? There's a true story I came across. 
some years ago, a retired couple, they were so worried, they were alarmed, they were frightened by the threat of nuclear war. So they undertook a serious study of all the inhabited places on the globe. Their goal was to determine where in the world would be the place to be least likely affected by war, a place of ultimate security. They studied and they traveled, they traveled and they studied, and finally they found the place, an island. And on Christmas, they sent their pastor a Christmas card from their new home in the Falkland Islands. Now, I don't know if you know your history or not, but however, history tells us their so-called paradise was soon turned into a war zone by Britain and Argentina, the war of the Falkland Islands. They searched diligently, and it can't be found geographical. He is our hiding place. In a relationship with the Almighty God, He is our hiding place for sure. And we can be confident and we can be absolutely convinced and positive and persuaded that God's going to take care of us. And in 2019, the best is yet to come because we're hiding in a relationship with Him. And all your needs are going to be met in a relationship with the Almighty God. Not just because you can think it up your own self. That ain't going to work so good. But you let God take care of you. I'm telling you, he will do so. He really will. You know what? I got a lot of stuff I want to tell you, but I don't have time to get to it. Hmm. Got four pages. How do you say four pages worth? You're like, you know, can't do it. Well, hmm. okay. I will share one little story with you and hope you grab the principle of it. Sometimes we think that God is up in heaven and he's like, nope, it's too much. Don't ask for that. Nope, it's too much. But I'm going to tell you, God is exactly the opposite of that. And let me share a little story by a guy that you probably know about. His name is John Newton. He discovered the gravity, gravitational pull, the apple, fell out of the tree, bunged him on the head. Oh, gravity, you know. He figured it out. But John Newton received from the Lord some almost unbelievable answers to his prayers. And so he often engaged in large requests large asking from God. In support of this practice, he would frequently tell the story of a man who asked Alexander the Great to give him a huge sum of money in exchange for his daughter's hand in marriage. He gave Alexander the Great his daughter, and he asked for this phenomenal amount of money in exchange. The ruler consented and told him to request of his treasure whatever he wanted. It's like you're going down to the bank and it says, just write the check out for whatever you want. Anybody cool with that? Huh? Yeah. So he went and he asked for an enormous amount. And the keeper to the funds was startled and said he couldn't give him that much without a direct order. So he went to Alexander, his treasurer, and the treasurer argued that even a small fraction of the money that was requested would be more uh, to serve the purpose more than he could ever imagine. No, replied Alexander. Let him have it all. I like that fella. He does me honor. He treats me like a king and proves by what he asks that he believes me to be both very rich and generous. Newton concluded the story by saying, in the same way, we should go to the throne of God's grace and present petitions that express honorable views of the love and the riches and the bounty of our king. Faith honors God, and God honors faith. If we abide in his will and trust him implicitly, the Lord will reward 
our confidence for sure. When you go to God, he's not going, well, you know what? I ain't got that much in the account today, so come back next month. But see, if that's what we believe, that's what we're going to get. Well, I know God don't really want to give me that. He don't really want to help me in this situation. My Bible says all things are possible to those who believe. And fear has entered into a marriage with us. You think it's about time to kick fear out? He's got spectacular things for you and me in the year 2019. He really does, for sure. He does, and he wants us to be confident and convinced and persuaded. He wants that. No worry, no fear. Over and over, at least 365 times in the Bible, it says, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. The opposite of fear is faith. And faith comes by hearing his word. And he wants us to believe all the positive things he's written to us in his word. And it will change your life genuinely forever. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so very much for your word. Thank you for allowing us to read it and to study it. And Lord, may it take hold of our lives, of our minds, and of our souls, our hearts, May your word take hold of us. And may we truly become greater believers than we've ever been before. Help us to overcome the doubt and the worry. And help us to kick out the fear that has tried to take over and rule our lives. Help us to kick out the doubt and the worry and the anxiety. Help us, almighty God, each and every one of us in this building and those watching online, help us to truly become Believers, for sure, absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt to hear what you're saying and to believe it and take it to heart. Bless my brothers and sisters here and who hear your message and may we become a changed people from this day forward. And as our heads are bowed, I would ask you to reaffirm your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ with me right now as we pray. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I believe that you love me. That's why you sent your son Jesus. I believe he died in my place. I believe he rose from the dead and is knocking at the door of my heart. And I open wide the door and I receive Jesus as my Savior, my Lord, and my King. Now as our heads are still bowed, I want to pray a prayer for you. Father, I just ask that in every man, in every woman, every boy and girl who hears us here, <clears throat> watching online, in the cafe or in the balcony, wherever they may be, I ask that you begin to show us, Almighty God, how much you are for us. Begin to convince us of your love and your passion. Begin to convince us <clears throat> how much you want to answer our prayers. How much you want to bless us, almighty God. I ask that you reveal your love to us, Lord, tonight and tomorrow and this coming week that we would see and we would sense it. We would experience your love where it would just blow our socks off that you love us so absolutely so much. Convince us of your goodness, almighty God, in such a dynamic way that we'll want to tell other people about how awesome and how good you are. Answer the prayers of my brothers and my sisters. Lord, give them the desires of their heart as they're learning to delight themselves in you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen and amen. Thank you.